Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to be bringing you this special broadcast in partnership with USRA STEM Action Center and the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And this series is thanks to presenting sponsor Lockheed Martin. We are all here today because NASA's Perseverance rover is touching down on Mars tomorrow. The landing is expected about 3.55 Eastern, um, but coverage begins on various NASA channels at 2.15 including NASA and NASA Espanol YouTube. Um, we're gonna be putting a link in the chat right now about where you can find more information about tuning in tomorrow. And the chat is also where we wanna hear from you today. Um, in the chat with us today, we have two planetary scientists, Dr. Candace Bedford and Marina Gemma. Dr. Herman Martinez is unable to make it today and we are thinking of him and everyone in Texas um, due to the current situation. Um, so Marina and Dr. Candace Bedford will be answering all your questions and will also be bringing some on screen at the end of the program. So please be sure to submit them throughout. Um, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Carter Emmert, the Director of Astro Visualization at the American Museum of Natural History, who will be our pilot and tour guide today in open space. And he'll be introducing our special guest. Carter? Hi, Corey. All Hi, right, Corey. take it away. All right, thank you, and uh, welcome to today's uh, honoring of uh, perseverance of uh, um, approaching and arriving at Mars tomorrow. Um, and uh, so we're celebrating that. Uh, uh, what better way to do that uh, than to do that with astronauts? Before I introduce them, I want to just mention that we're doing this in our uh, software called Open Space. Open Space is a NASA-supported interactive uh, data visualization of like the entire universe. And I'll be flying it live today, and uh, but also um, uh, sending questions out to our honored guests, uh, three astronauts who have been there in space. And uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first off is Mary Cleave. Mary has uh, been uh, twice into space in uh, 1985 and and 1989, both on uh, the good ship, uh, the space shuttle Atlantis. And uh, then Paul Richards, uh, Paul was uh, uh, in, in space helping to build the International Space Station on a mission in 2001 aboard Discovery. And then Alvin Drew, and Alvin, Alvin has been up twice uh, on uh, both uh, Endeavor um, with uh, one, of, uh, one of his uh, crewmates on this, actually his commander was Scott Kelly, uh, who you know is, is uh, um, being the, the longest uh, duration up on the International Space Station. And, um, but uh, also uh, crewmate Barbara Morgan, who was a school teacher in space uh, going up uh, after uh, the tragedy of Challenger and the, the loss of uh, Kristen McCullough, who was a school teacher, part of that crew. Um, but also Alvin was on the last uh, journey of, uh, of the uh, space shuttle uh, discovery, and so we're very honored to have you all. Thank you for uh, joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you. So I think we're going to uh, now uh, cut over to our visualization uh, of Earth, and uh, really, uh, uh, this is a view that just uh, uh, just a couple hundred people have really seen, of, of which um, <laughs> you are three members of that. And I thought I'd start uh, with you, Mary, just to, about what it's like to be in space. I'm sure that this is a question you get asked a lot, but also just the view of Earth uh, uh, from space and that you are you are really an environmental engineer. Uh, so I, I, I think what, what better person to ask about the view of, of Earth from space? Well, I mean, flying in space is a lot of fun. I mean, weighing nothing is a lot of fun, <laughs> but... Um, when you're flying in a spaceship, you have a lot of work to do. And as a crew, um, I was the environmental engineer and then most of the other guys were uh, pilots and test pilots. And uh, so they expected me to have the moments of, oh, look at the beautiful earth. And in fact, we all did. It is such a beautiful, delicate place. We're uh, so lucky to have an atmosphere and water that supports us. The atmosphere is extremely 
skinny when you look at it from up there. I mean, you know, you just sort of think, wow, is that all we have between us and space? That's really, we got to be really careful with it, I think, because it's just, there's not that much of it and we, we need to take care of our planet. But um, Atlantis was a great spaceship and I'm really lucky that I got to fly on her. Well, one of uh, your, your second mission, uh, uh, Mary, you, you actually uh, were delivering uh, a, um, a space probe to uh, go off to Venus, the Magellan mission that, that mapped Venus. Is that right? Yes. And the spaceship was so big. It was the first planetary we ever deployed out of the shuttle. And it was so big, we really didn't have much room for anything else. So it was a min-flight um, duration, as short, as short as you can get. But um, it was amazing to look up and see Venus from space and then understand what we just deployed was going there. It was really mind blowing. So, wow. yeah. I was wondering what the stars looked like uh, um, from uh, from space and you know, especially, so I guess you're going around the earth every hour and a half, is that right? That's right. So you get a sunrise sunset about every 45 minutes if you like those too, it's a good deal. <laughs> But the, the stars, I mean, I was, I was the navigator on my first flight, and so I had to be able to uh, identify our nav stars because the navigation stars we use with spaceships are the same ones we've been using since sailing ships. So, but wow. you, so you have to be uh, able to identify them. When I first looked out at space without an atmosphere to look through, I was absolutely amazed at how much was there. I mean, it was really great. Like. It's like being out much better, even better than being out where there's no light pollution on a dark top of a dark mountain. So, wow. Um, I, and uh, I, I just I wanted to ask you it, it, when you wake up in space, what's what's that like? I mean, do you, you feel disoriented? Like, oh my gosh, I'm in space. <laughs> like yeah. you must, you know, you're up for a few days, so you have to sleep. And I, I'm just wondering. Yeah, you you have to sleep, and you're. Your first day in space, if everything goes right, is very, very long. So by the time you get to fall asleep, you don't have any trouble falling asleep. <laughs> but you have to remember to put your hands on your pockets so your hands don't come up and hit yourself in the head and wake you up. Okay, so you have pockets you put your hands in. Wow. Then you just float, float around. So you, you actually have trouble when you get back. My first night trying to sleep in my bed, I ended up going out and buying a new mattress because it was too lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I'm coming up on the space station that we see a line here. Um, I, was, I was sort of hunting for it uh, um, to uh, uh, get a little closer to it. Um, now, I know you're on uh, two missions with the, the space shuttle um, that, of course, uh, was used then later to uh, uh, to build out um, and uh, our, our sort of permanent uh, presence in space. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on the uh, International Space Station now. And um, so I, I thought uh, I, I'd ask Paul, you were involved in, um, in the construction of this and, and uh, what that was like and what your first flight in space was like for you. Oh, my gosh. Look at that yeah. picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, uh, folks from the outside taken inside. I believe that was on the first spacewalk. Uh, so our job on STS-102, we were the first crew rotation. So we brought up Expedition 2 and uh, brought home Expedition 1, uh, which launched six months ahead of us uh, before our uh, mission. And uh, we did two spacewalks in construction. And, um, yeah, you know, the view from space, uh, you know, they train you so much that for me, it was hard sometimes to remember what really happened after the mission and what was in training, you know, because you do things over and over again, but the view is something that they can't train, you know? And it was interesting to me, the dichotomy of looking down at earth, you know, launching out Florida. And then eight and a half minutes later, we were at sunrise in Florida, eight and a half minutes later in the, in the discovery, we were over the Alps uh, in Europe. And then uh, I had to be reminded uh, by Vegas, the pilot, to look down because I was heads down doing calculations. And he's like, uh, hey, Paul, that could wait. Get unstrap and look out the window. We're in space. Wow. I was like, oh, yeah. So 
I, I went and looked and it was just amazing. That first view, uh, similar to what we're seeing now, the, you know, noon hitting those mountain peaks. And then during my whole mission, I got to, when we were on the space station, they have a better window, which um, is a Nader window that's optical quality and looking down and it's pretty big. And, you know, parts of, uh, it's in the bottom of the laboratory module and parts of the earth, you know, look like nobody's been here. Um, you could see deserts and mountains and it looks like there's no humans. And then you see other parts where you see sediment coming out of rivers and going thousands of miles into the ocean, or you see all the smoke coming out of um, coal fired power plants in Asia and backing up on like Taiwan and you see the smog and, and it's like, oh, okay, people are definitely here. So that was pretty interesting. Wow. Well, um, I, you know, the, it, what we're seeing here underneath the, uh, the Earth is actually an image from a few days ago um, taken by NASA satellite. And uh, um, so that we're actually seeing sort of what, what the Earth looks like down to about a half a kilometer resolution. So um, in the simulation where we have the model of the ISS and so forth. But, um, but uh, I, I guess uh, that view from space is just must be tremendous. Um, and uh, uh, I, I wonder in in uh, in your case, you were also on spacewalk, and what the difference mm -hmm. was between being in cabin and and outside. Where I, I'm sure you're very busy, but you must have taken a few moments to steal a a view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that you know one of the one of the advice I talk to a lot of folks, and they you know the advice is when you do a spacewalk, don't forget to look down. You can get so focused on your job, and somebody says, "How was the view?" and you forgot to look. So, um, you know, it's, you saw us looking through those windows and, and the shuttle windows are like triple pane and they've got dents and scratches from years of flying. And so eventually your eyes adjust to looking through them and you know, the camera doesn't pick up those. But when you go out, um, you know, on a spacewalk and you're, you're climbing around the station, you got a 180 degree view in a nice polished, you know, plexiglass dome you know, and you can look up, down, left, right. And, you know, the, the, it's, it's just liberating to see that, you know, and very up close. And I always say, it's like, uh, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I don't know if they still have them going to a zoo. Uh, and we used to drive through these zoos in New Jersey and, uh, you drive through the safari. Well, going on a spacewalk is like getting out of the car and being able to walk around the animals, you know, uh, and walk up close. Uh, so, and then jungle um, habitat. <laughs> yeah, was jungle cool. habitat. That was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. And then, you know, you get such a great perspective. Uh, we had to actually go fix one of the solar rays. And, and uh, on our configuration, it was only one solar ray and it was stacked on top. So we had to climb all the way to the top of it and use a very sophisticated tool called a crowbar and um <laughs> and then tap the lock in place uh so the the uh, solar array would actually it's a four bar mechanism and it would lock and they could tell it wasn't locked by all the engineers on the ground looking at the dynamics of the boosting and they could tell something was wrong with that solar array and we went up and uh, fixed it so so do you ever get a sense of vertigo out there sort of like oh my gosh i'm really up high <laughs> I did not. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, it's very interesting when you put humans in space. We got three here that had uh, a lot of similar experiences, but some different experiences. And, you know, our journey, you know, uh, to Earth, to the moon and to Mars, you know, the uh, once you put the human in the loop, there's so many variables. And that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to find out all these variables that, you know, different humans react different ways. So uh, and we're just in the infancy of doing that. Well, I, I thought what I'd do is is pull away so that we can actually I'll, I'll bring back that trail of the uh, of the space station um, and uh, the uh, the uh, atmosphere thickness I, I, is is amazing. Mary, you, you spoke to to this. Um, I, I think the the late Carl Sagan uh, gave a proportion of it to uh, about the skin of uh, of an apple to the apple. Um, and the ISS orbits about 250 miles up, but the uh, thinness of the atmosphere about 20 miles or so before it goes to black. I, obviously, it, it sort of it 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 sort of exponentially decays outward. But I guess what we see is only about 20 miles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, okay, so I'll, I'll pull out here just a little bit, and uh, 
I'd like to bring up other satellites and uh, we'll just start uh, moving um, this. In fact, let me center on the Earth. I was centered on the space station. Um, but uh, um, just the sense of um, of launching and having to do everything by time. I, I guess, you know, it's just one thing about where you are in space, but it's a, the better question is, when are you in space? Yeah. Um, so so I, I, I was just wondering if you want to talk about you know, just just this aspect of uh, of being in in, in Earth orbit. It's uh, you go around the Earth, and uh, Mary, I think you mentioned that uh, you know every sort of ninety minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you know, and go ahead, Mary. Well, it just what struck me was you go across the United States in about seven and a half minutes. Okay? Wow! <laughs> so the next time when you get in a a plane and you have to sit and fly from New York to California, you sort of go, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I could have gone around the earth several times. That's right. Well, uh, yeah, and as as navigators, you know, the the one thing, you know, it's not like flying an airplane when you're in space because you have to use mm -hmm. uh, you know, orbital mechanics. Um, mm -hmm. and so you know, what you do with uh, speed on one side of the earth affects position 45 minutes later on the other side of the, word, the earth. And the faster you go, the higher you go, the higher you go, the slower you go, <laughs> the slower you go, the lower you go. And so it's not like the movies where you actually speed up to uh, come in to a reentry like on earth or on Mars. You have to actually slow down to come in. So you put the vehicles backwards and fire your engines in the opposite direction. Wow. Um, and so you're always flying 45 minutes ahead um, because you change speed on the one side. Like if you want to rendezvous with the um, uh, International Space Station, you know, you have to make your orbital maneuvers on one side to change your position on the other. And we're really in low Earth orbit. And you can see the, the geo belt there with the geo. So they're so high up. And they are actually moving with the rotation of the Earth. Uh, so weather satellites, communication satellites. Um, so their period of revolution when they are the, you know, the distance equals the circumference of the Earth in orbital mechanics, um, they rotate uh, or they go around the Earth in an orbit that's one day. So they always seem to stay over the same position of the Earth uh, below as it's rotating underneath it as well. Mm -hmm. What happened there? There was a gap in the Earth, is because it, we actually rotated past the date line, and, and this particular <laughs> date uh, was missing just a little bit of data, I think, from the satellite. Um, I wanted to actually show uh, another aspect. Uh, of course, Earth being the dynamic planet, it is uh, the water planet, uh, blue from the scattering in the atmosphere, but uh, of course, we're seventy percent covered with water. Uh, we of course see the filigree of clouds, and then also the uh, um, the snows on the high altitudes of the mountain ranges we saw a little earlier. Uh, if I just come down here, we can see uh, Antarctica in uh, illumination. So the poles, uh, of course, are cold because they're always sort of right at the edge of, of, uh, of sunlight or, or not, depending on the season. Um, but uh, this dynamic Earth, it's, it's so alive. Obviously, uh, it's got humans putting stuff up there. But um, if, I, if I just I'm going to fade to black for a second... Um, and then uh, a readjusted time element to fade back up here and bring up the magnetic field of Earth, uh, which is something that is invisible. But um, just as we don't see wind, we can see its effect on a windsock or on trees. And um, this is also um, an effect that uh, you all as astronauts sort of have to deal with. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, well, it, it's the magnetosphere, which is produced because we have a magnetic field on our planet, is what protects us from solar wind, which is produced by the sun. And if we, and that's I'll pull back to show the solar wind, Mary. Yeah, that's that's the purple stuff that's being diverted around the red, which is our right. magnetic field. Lines. Yeah. So so you have the shock wave in the front, and then a tail on the back, and where it, it tails off. So it, it's variable depending on how much plasma is being ejected from this, our sun. Uh, but this really does protect us 
but when you know so when you're in space you're in low earth orbit you're protected by the magnetosphere unless you go through dips there's a dip north pole south pole because that's where the magnetic field goes into the Earth's core um, and then there's another dip in the South Atlantic called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And if you are have your eyes closed, you can sometimes can tell if you're on a hot flight. I, my second flight was at, near Solar Max, so it was pretty hot. Wow. Uh, I could tell when we went through the South Atlantic Anomaly, I was well, falling asleep, but I, I had uh, excitation on my retina, so I went up to the flight deck and looked at where we were, and sure enough, we were going through the South Atlantic anomaly. Wow, and I, I, Alvin, I, I think you mentioned you, you saw that too and described what those flashes were like, or, or that uh, that you actually, well, what was that like? <laughs> yeah, so I was a bit surprised because I you know people had described the fact that she would see flashes, but I thought they made like little sparkles or like, like seeing a firefly or something, and it was not. It was if your eyes were closed and somebody stood in front of you with a flash on a camera and, and lit it off. And so it's, it's, you got that, wow. except it's usually in one eye, not both eyes. Um, but that was a, it's a, it's a pretty bright flash and, it, and, it, and it's, it's your entire field of view in that eye when it goes off like that. Wow, that's just, that's that's stunning and, and a little worrying of it, think, because <laughs> you're absorbing this radiation. Um, but uh, um, I, I wanted to sort of point out, you know, I brought up the moon's orbit, which is about 10 times the distance of the geosynchronous satellites. Geosynchronous satellites are about 22,000 miles above the equator, um, at fall, as you described, and, and about 10 times that distance is lunar orbit. And so when we go to the moon, or when we last went to the moon was December 1972, um, that uh, the moon orbits in and out of this, uh, uh, Mary, I think you described the magneto tail. Um, mm -hmm. Here, if I turn off the solar wind uh, just uh, for a second, we can see um, the just the behavior of the uh, Earth's magnetic field. If I pull out a little bit, you see that there's sort of these long arms of it going off in the up and down direction. And that's, uh, those are, this is really um, uh, just the local solar magnetic field interacting with our magnetic field. And that's that's what gives, I guess, the dynamics here. Um, but uh, um, of course, astronauts have been to the moon. And uh, so I, I wanted to sort of focus on, on that. And, um, and Alvin, I, I wanted to ask you uh, a, a, about this. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just make sure I um, am uh, doing the right thing, flying and, and talking at the same time. But uh, um, to come in on the moon, um, Alvin, you were you were inspired as as, as a child uh, for um, with with what was going on with Apollo, and it, it made you want to be an astronaut. Is that correct? That's it. I, I was um, in first grade arithmetic, and, uh, and and not enjoying it particularly much. Um, when our principal walked into the classroom and and, and stopped <laughs> the class, which which meant my day was already looking good. She pulled out our, our old black and white TV set with the rabbit ears, and, and we're gonna we're gonna watch TV instead of doing arithmetic. This is getting even better. And when the, the TV comes up, and there's uh, the Apollo Seven rocket, the uh, Saturn V, sitting there, and there's some guy counting backwards from ten. And I just learned those numbers, so I knew he was going the wrong way. Uh, and, and then when he hit, you know, that zero, this thing lifted off and just flew straight up into the sky. And I, I, I was a little bit gobsmacked about that. I asked this <laughs> principal, "What's this all about?" And she said. Well, the, this one isn't going to the moon yet, but in a, in a few f short months, uh, we'll be on the moon. And I was five and a half, and I knew a few things. And I knew for one thing, the moon was all the way up in the sky, and you couldn't get there. And these guys were crazy. And I told her that. And she uh, she said, no, I, I'd keep watching you. You should pay attention. I think we'll get there uh, with a little bit of luck. So I paid attention. And the more I paid attention, it was, uh, of course, I was like, more excited about this program, especially because we're in a race with the Soviet Union. And then finally, uh, on uh, July of 1969, uh, about nine months later, we were on the moon, like she, like she said. And I remember asking my dad, he says, uh, okay, I got to make some career planning here. I, I need to figure out what kind of job <laughs> do I need to have so I can uh, make enough money to go do what these guys are doing. It looks like fun. And he told me there was this job called being an astronaut where they paid you to go to the moon. Wow. Because I couldn't, I, I go, they're going to pay me to go do what these guys are doing, <laughs> Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong are doing. I said, yeah, he said, there's some fine print there about getting good grades and staying out of trouble and, uh, and not talking back to your parents. And I said, well, how about two out of three? 
Well, it's it's funny. I mean, the moon is couldn't be more different from the Earth. I mean, this is this like the blue Earth, the gray moon, and uh, of course, uh, I brought up the Apollo emblems here. This this shows this is the side of the moon that you, you may be used to seeing. Um, the sun is behind the moon now, so I sort of made the moon glow just uh, overall so that we can see it. Uh, but Apollo 11, uh, we see the eagle of Apollo 11 that uh, was their emblem and, um, of course, landed in the Sea of Tranquility in one of the dark features, uh, the dark, smooth areas. What are all these holes? They, well, we now understand by having gone to the moon that these are impact craters. These are these are basically giant holes from the explosion of asteroids uh, hitting the moon very fast. Um, and, of course, we... We brought rocks back that allowed us to date them in the laboratories and that we found the moon was very old, uh, about you know four billion years old, uh, oldest uh, moon rock, about four and a half billion years old. Um, but uh, we, we have um, also uh, just uh, our last mission, perhaps our most ambitious mission, where the last three missions we had cars, uh, but uh, Apollo 17, so um, that's that's the one that's, uh, that we're going to come in on now. Uh, so, Alan, I, I was just wondering, you know, um, how this lunar exploration, you saw that early on, but you must have been very inspired watching uh, the Apollo missions unfold. It was such an alien landscape, like you said, and uh, and it just seems like it's different every time you see it. Uh, I've ever read Mike Collins' book, but there was an ongoing debate yeah. between the astronauts about the actual color of the moon. Some thought it was kind of a beige or tan, others thought it was gray. And, was, and you look in different pictures, it's, it's different colors when you see them. So it's just fascinating that, that, that the moon has this, this that weird quality about it that depending on the lighting, it's different colors. Also, the fact that, you know, every time you, you get closer in, there's there's more and more craters. You know, you see the big craters from up distance, but then there's like zillions more tiny ones as you get closer down to the surface. Wow. We're, we're coming up to uh, Apollo 17's Taros Litro Valley uh, landing site. Uh, the South Massif over on the left uh, is uh, um, more than a mile high. It's uh, um, this, this valley is Jack Schmidt, who is the only geologist, the only scientist to uh, uh, go to the moon, um, uh, likes to characterize it as, as this valley is deeper than the Grand Canyon. And um, so I'm coming up to one of their lunar tra uh, traverses where they went with the uh, car. They drove over to a boulder that they had seen had uh, uh, rolled down the hill, and um, so thanks to the photography that uh, was, was taken by Gene Cernan, who's the commander, and Jack Schmidt, the geologist, we can actually um, look at uh, um, some of the rocks here um, done by, uh, we just sort of took the pictures uh, that they took and put it into some photogrammetry software. In fact, a high school student of mine had, had produced this, and uh, Gave us a nice result where we can come right up and look at these rocks. So here we are. We're looking at uh, at, at this particular one. But what's uh, what really nice uh, is if I just pull away a little bit, uh, we can actually go over and see one of the footprints of the astronauts. So let's do that. I'll just come over here. And uh, this boulder uh, um, sort of broke up as it, as it came in. So let me uh, pan over here and let's just see if I can fly well enough as, as uh, um, you guys can uh, speak to this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this uh, inspired all of you uh, at the time that we were actually walking on the moon and wanting to be an astronaut. I always wished I could be, but uh, I have to satisfy myself with computer graphics. <laughs> uh, yeah, I too was, uh, you know, uh, a child that looked at Apollo, so very similar to Alvin, uh, our teachers rolled out. It had to be, and I look back, it had to be when I was in uh, kindergarten. And so it, I think it was the launch of Apollo 13, because that was like sometime in the spring of uh, like 70 or 71. So um, wow. yeah, that, that first glimpse, you know, just like, you know, hopefully some of the glimpses that, you know, some of the students or some of the the kids on, on the line today look at this or look at the, you know, us going to the station or back to the moon with Artemis or Perseverance on Mars, that they're inspired and, uh, you know, they follow in our footsteps, like uh, these footsteps we're looking at here. The little treads, the, the parallel treads of the, the boot prints we actually sort of see in 3D. And then these uh, these rocks, uh, there's a volcanic rock, has uh, some vesicles. In fact, 
parts of this are our our, uh, our, our uh, partners today with the Lunar and Planetary Institute. They have uh, some of the samples uh, from the moon right there in Houston uh, at the uh, laboratory. Um, incredible, and uh, so that we, we see that here. Um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll sort of back away now and, and uh, uh, fly over to just see what they landed in, which uh, uh, doesn't look much like a, a flying device, hardly at all. Um, I guess it's, you know it's uh, all airplanes uh, deal with having to fly through uh, fly through air, but the lunar module, I guess, just only had to fly in space. Yes, for me, that's one, that for me, that was probably the most fascinating engineering marvel of the uh, of that entire program. The Saturn V, you know, it's a it's a big thundering rocket, impressive in its own right. But the lunar module, mm -hmm. um, the fact that they had to the, the weight constraints um, and everything that was upon it was probably the toughest engineering challenge. And I think, although it's not the prettiest part of the program, probably the most elegant design that we had out there uh, for getting uh, two astronauts to the surface of the moon and, and back up to the orbiting module. Right here, um, we see uh, another close-up uh, image. We can actually see, in fact, let me pull back just a little bit. Down in the lower uh, foreground is something called LRV. These are pictures taken really within the last decade or so by our Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this, this is a mission that's gone back, looking at the stuff we left on the moon, as I mentioned, the last mission here in uh, December of 1972. And uh, the red flag shows where the lander is. And you can see parallel tracks, which are uh, from the tire treads of, of the rover. Um, but then more sort of randomly sort of walking around, we can see the boot trails of the astronauts. And uh, here we have a little bit of photogrammetry of the lunar module you can go and see at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum on the, on the mall in Washington, D.C. And uh, so we can see how they... Um, uh, you know, had to land in this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's, it's it's like we're we're looking at you know, this is kind of looking at you know analogous to Columbus's whoa. first journey in 1492 when it was a flyby. You know, uh, and then you know, hopefully we're going to go back and, and make a settlement like Jamestown. You know, uh, um, so that's amazing to be able to see this history and have it preserved. Uh, you know, that you can actually watch it and not just read about it. You can actually visually see this. Pretty amazing that, uh, you know, we, we've been able to photograph the, the, the stuff that we've left there. And, uh, oh, actually, I just want to show one little thing. Uh, over on the left, you can see uh, one of the boot trails. And it's a little bit darker. And then you can see a smaller uh, uh, marker for the flag. Um, and uh, one of the astronauts went over here to compose a picture of the American flag with the lunar module Challenger uh, behind it. So um, the, the name Challenger, of course, is uh, our uh, ill-fated space shuttle, um, but uh, we all honor the crew of both, uh, of course, uh, Challenger and Columbia. Um, but they were able to get a picture of the American flag in, in front of uh, the lunar module and that we could see those, those boot trails now effectively. So uh, I'm, I'm going to pull out uh, away now, and I'm, I'm going to just set up for um, just you know going from the moon to Mars. I, one thing I should mention is uh, the, I didn't mention it is the moon is one fourth the size of the Earth, and so it doesn't have as much mass, can't hold on to an atmosphere, and uh, so that, that uh, really it's a, a different kind of world than the Earth, and the Earth is so dynamic. The moon does not have a a magnetosphere or an atmosphere or a hydrosphere <laughs> water so um, what I'll do is uh, just set up for our, our next uh, chapter here and uh, right here okay and um, so this uh, um, Paul I, I'm gonna show some uh, uh, orbital dynamics uh, right now we're, we're set up now we're high above the solar system I've, I've moved out far away uh, from the, the moon is only about a quarter million miles away from Earth. Um, and um, I'm going to just show now I'm going to run time so that we can see that we go around the sun in one year and it takes about two years for Mars to go around. So this I, I was starting in April of 2018. Uh, we came as close as about 35 million miles away from Mars. 
it would be really nice if we could just go instantaneously. But why does it take so long to get to Mars? I understand that it takes about six months. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the the uh, well the distance and the speed. So again, you have to leave Earth's atmosphere and you have to get all that mass uh, out of gravity. So you have to bring all your fuel with you uh, for this one. So you want to um, get leave when it's the closest. So um, you can see there that um, you know that your M twenty twenty one was uh, a Perseverance, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. And, so uh, that left Earth when it was the closest Mars and Earth, and you have to fly where Mars is going to be, not where Mars is it is. And yeah, it takes, you know, so every two years there's a window of minimal fuel uh, to get there. Wow, so it'd be really nice if we could just sort of ride like a laser beam straight there, but uh, uh, not with any technology we have now, I guess. No, the way I describe it is, um, if you've ever watched roller derby, um, and they're, everybody's orbiting around the track, and it's like the, the Earth and, the, and Mars are orbiting around the sun, if you're gonna, Say somebody's on the outer rail and you want to catch up to them, you wouldn't just stop and turn 90 degrees and go out to them. Um, you would Somebody would give you a big boost from the inside of that rack and you coast up to that person and maybe take them out because it's roller derby. Um, but you never would take that straight line there. You, 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 you take that circular route around the track. And that's if, if you look at the gravity well around the sun, it really is like a roller derby rink and they're just they're rolling around in that, in that pit. Wow, I, I should have mentioned uh, we didn't label the interior planets, but uh, Venus goes around. We, we, of course, Earth goes around 365 days. Uh, Venus goes around 225 days, and uh, Mercury uh, 88 days, the same number as keys on a piano. It's uh, um, just you know, it goes around really quickly. Uh, but Mars takes almost two years, uh, and and this 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 notion of having to lead out in front of it is is, is quite interesting. I'm going, uh, it's January 20, I'm stepping through just to sort of get closer. And I guess they come up and meet. And uh, we haven't actually seen Mars just yet. I'm stopping here at February 11, and I wanna come in um, close to Mars. So let's, let's do that now. As I do, the label may disappear. Um, but we've been looking at these trajectories from a standpoint of like above the solar system. Uh, but what Mars sees is the spacecraft sort of diving in um, toward. So we begin to grow a trail here of what Mars would see. So I'll, I'll let me get a little closer and I'm gonna turn off the, uh, uh, the trail. Uh, give me a moment here uh, just to go to, uh, to do that, uh, let's see. I'm going to turn off its trail so that now we just see that little tiny um, trail of it sort of diving at Mars. And so I'll go February 12, 13, 14. Whoa, I don't want to go too, too quickly. And uh, if I come in closer now, we can see that Mars actually has two moons, Deimos and Phobos, uh, smaller. And uh, so we'll get in close. And, um, and then let me just orient around. So, uh, okay, I'm doing this manually, but uh, let's see. Uh, there we go, I, I went another day, this is February 16th, and there, this is today. And uh, so, looking at Mars, and so um, here we see uh, a rusty looking world, it's uh, iron oxide on its surface, uh, makes it uh, reddish brown, and uh, there is a slight atmosphere, and Mars is interestingly twice the size of the moon or half the size of Earth. It has craters like the moon, um, but then uh, also has smooth areas like we saw on our moon or large impacts filled with lava and, uh, and then also uh, dark patches and so on. Mary, I was wondering just, you know, from your, uh, from your perspective as an environmental engineer, the sort of differences between you know Earth and Mars, um, and and how that plays out. I've highlighted where uh, where we're going and where we're going to land. Okay. But I, I thought maybe uh, well well maybe if you describe that a little bit, I'll just give a, a quick tour of Mars um, just to see because everybody thinks oh where's the volcano and where's the canyon. So I, I'll that's sort of on the other side from where we're going. Yeah. Well, I mean Mars is the has the largest dust storms of any planet in the solar system. So, um, but the atmosphere is only about um, 
a hundred times thinner than ours. And wow. what happened, we, they're still discussing why, but at some point in time, Mars lost its magnetic field. And then the solar wind was able to strip most of its atmosphere away. Okay. Jeez. So it's sitting there without the protection that we have. Magnetic protection, um, which also leads to the loss of the atmospheric protection. So there may have earlier when there was atmosphere there, there may have been water on the surface of Mars, which is part of what we're looking for. Um, it, you know, some we're going to places where we think we might be able to find life, which lived in the water or might be under the surface still. So, oh, there goes one of the little moons. I, I brought us to a vantage point where we could kind of see um, regionally, both the large volcanoes, there are three in a line called the Tharsis Montes. There's the famous, of course, Olympus Mons, larger than New York State, and um, that's uh, off the, the main track of three. And then um, they're also dark because they're kind of sticking up out of the atmosphere, scattering the dusty atmosphere of Mars. Um, and then we see the great Vallis Marineris which would stretch from sort of New York to Los Angeles on a world half the size of our planet. And if I get a little closer, uh, Mary, I, I can show you the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the fluvial outflow channels, which uh, yeah. um, carved by water. So. Yeah. So the, and that, that's where, you know, it, they think the probability of finding remnants of life and that's why they want to collect samples because we need to bring them back so we can look at them in a laboratory with really sophisticated instruments. But we'll just collect them on this mission and then send another one to pick them up. Well, great. Um, I, I think uh, just the engineering of getting there is, is, is amazingly uh, you know, sophisticated. And uh, so I might want all Three of you to talk about that, or, or perhaps uh, Paul, I, I think you wanted to talk about it as well. Um, but let me actually, I had gone, rotated Mars backwards, and I'm going to just, I have to be very careful because I didn't want the uh, uh, the trajectory or the, the path, the line of, of, uh, of perseverance coming in and intersecting. So once again, we'll probably see that uh, if I just aim up in the right direction. Uh, well, let me let me just rotate Mars around so that we, we can see where we're headed. You see Phobos going by and then Deimos. Okay, and then uh, this is where, uh, this is today. And um, so, uh, and then if, uh, they, they, okay, I, I need to go one more time around. So my apologies. Mm -hmm. So as we uh, come in, this is February 18th, uh, we can now see that, that little square patch um, of Jezero, uh, Jezero Crater um, coming up. It's, it's near a darkest patch of, of Mars. Uh, there we can now see the path of Perseverance coming in, and it's beginning to arc because it's, it looks like it's in straight at Mars, but it's actually aimed sort of right at the edge of it, or so we hope. And as we get closer, we're, we're really coming in close, and we can see now this arc as it's coming in, affected by the gravity. And um, I think we are, we're going to quickly cut to a video of one of our colleagues' work. Uh, this is an interactive program by, called Eyes on the Solar System. and. Um, and you can download this as well. We have uh, information, uh, if, or you actually just need a website. Just go to it. Um, and uh, but this shows. Um, we'll, we'll start talking to the technology here. Um, so this is the entry, descent, and landing phase. And again, this is orbital dynamics and physics. Uh, so um, <laughs> you know all that energy that you put into this, and it got uh, by slingshotting around the planets and. and take off, it's got to be taken out. And you, you do that by managing your energy uh, coming in and using orbital dynamics. So you actually have to slow down to come in, not speed up. So another thing to keep in mind is that it's all about gas for about every pound of anything you want to send out to Mars and back if you're on a human mission. It's going to take about a thousand pounds of fuel. 
And so you want to take advantage of the fact that Mars has an atmosphere to give you a free slowdown. So as Paul said, you want to slow down, um, dip into the atmosphere and let the atmosphere drag, take care of the rest of that as much as it can before you get down low. Wow. So I, I guess here we see the, the heat shield and then the parachute and, and our, our destination. We're going to look a little closer at that with the other software, but uh, uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, so the technology, a lot of this, it's, you know, you have to design all these parts that, that move uh, and do a job in uh, harsh environments. Uh, uh, you know, there's the radiation uh, for the electronics. Um, and now you're getting the heat uh, of reentry or the cold of space. Um, and now you have to even account for the dust getting inside bearings and, and jamming things up. So. It's a hard engineering problem to uh, do, and that, that's what makes it so fun uh, to design some of these things. Yeah. And so if you look at it, even with that, that parachute on that um, system coming down, it was coming down at about 180 miles an hour, which is about 60 miles an hour than you would free fall if you jumped out of an airplane. So it's it's, it's certainly not going to bring you to a soft landing. So that's why you need these, you know, splat bags or rockets or cranes or these other things out there to bring you down to a soft touchdown for these types of vehicles. So this this is a jetpack that they actually lower the vehicle down on. Yeah, <laughs> it's a flying, flying crane. <laughs> it just seems crazy, but anyway, it worked on Curiosity in two thousand twelve. So this is similar, if I understand that correctly. Yes. Cool. So it'll it'll set it on the surface and fly itself away, and uh, the the crane itself, I imagine, will just crash land. But the, the rover gets to do a safe soft touchdown. Great. Well, I, I, I brought us down to the uh, uh, the target destination, um, and I know we're getting kind of short on time, probably because I talk too much, sorry. Um, we, we have a about a 30 mile wide crater, Jezero, and it's I'm, I'm trying to center it yeah, in the middle here. And uh, we see that there's a river system that flows in and then flows out. And uh, so 30 miles across, it has this delta. We have sort of higher resolution detail right here and that we just saw in the animation of the uh, vehicle and where it's going to come down and land, Perseverance. And so we hope all that goes well. But we can actually see, let me turn this around just a little bit, is this, this delta deposit because um, we had uh, water flowing in to this crater. Uh, and we believe it was about the depth of Lake Michigan, about uh, 800 feet in, in depth. And uh, it's interesting, as I understand that, uh, that uh, there are clay minerals um, that, that uh, were transported. The, the clay must have been made by the presence of liquid water and then carried into this lake. And that, uh, so there's sort of two episodes of the water that, uh, that, that infiltrated the surface making the material that was then deposited into a standing lake. And by all indications of the cratering record about the age uh, around the time that life got a foothold on Earth, or the oldest fossils we see about three and a half billion years ago, is the, our best estimate for dating uh, where this is. And so I'll just uh, bring this down so you can see maybe some of the detail of what it can see. But at this point, I, I know that uh, there are probably lots of questions uh, from our audience, and, and maybe we should uh, cut to some of that and, and perhaps uh, answer some of those wonderful questions. Yeah, I think we're going to bring some questions on screen now. So why don't you take us away, Carter, from Mars, um, and we'll sure. uh, get to those. Okay. It's always hard for me to stop talking about this stuff because it's just so it's it's so exciting to see Mars in great detail. It's been mapped by Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, other uh, missions that are there, and also a shout out to uh, China and the United Arab Emirates uh, that are also they got they got to Mars on this launch opportunity. They're already there in orbit, uh, and China will attempt the landing in May. So anyway, I'll back away now um, from from here. And well, we'll take in the questions.
Now, now, Bila from uh, Connecticut wants to know what do astronauts eat and drink in space? I, oh boy, I was looking at one of the menus of, of your flight, Alvin. And I was just saying that stuff looked pretty good. <laughs> it was, it was, it was even better than you thought because there was uh, an international flight that had just uh, crew that just left. So there was Italian food and Japanese food up there as well that wasn't on our menu that we got got to loot before they before it expired. So yeah, we had sushi up there. We had um, cheeses and sausages. Uh, had barbecue and steak. So uh, the only thing we don't eat are things that are crumbly like pretzels or popcorn because they, 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 they the crumbs don't just fall to the floor. They get in people's hair and then they get upset with you. Wow. I, I had a good experience in space because my first flight, I flew with uh, Rodolfo Nuri Villa, and he was a payload specialist from Mexico. So we got to try out tortillas in space, and we found out that they were by far superior for making sandwiches than bre regular bread is. And so that oh. was really a lot of fun. And then you can play with them, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Wow. Um, what was what was your favorite thing that uh, you ate up there? Um, I like peanut M and M's. Go ahead. It, so, uh, so it's go ahead. Paul. Um, uh, we each get to bring sometimes some fresh food on the shuttle uh, before you know it's going to last a couple of days. They pack it. Um, right at the end and sometimes the commander, you know, like no bananas because he didn't like the smell of bananas uh, um, And so for my fresh fruit item, I picked little Debbie's oatmeal cream pies yes. <laughs> And my crewmates yes. laughed at me, but they were gone on day one <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's wonderful mm -hmm. Well, uh, next question, I uh, let's see uh, from Corey. Yeah, I'm going to bring the next one on and just a reminder if anybody has any last questions they want to ask our astronauts, put them in the chat now and we continue to bring them up. So here's the next question. I, I'm in the eighth grade. What can you do right now to help uh, myself become an astronaut? Wow. <laughs> we were talking a little bit about that before we got started, I think. Yes. I would say the first thing is to actually believe that you can do it the whole time. Yeah. I think the hardest part of anybody becoming an astronaut is having the courage to, to send away for the application because you think that you know, there's no way they're ever going to pick me. Uh, you just have to know if, 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 if you believe it now in eighth grade, then you'll, you'll take the courses you need to, to get the education. You'll, you'll do the things to prepare yourself. Um, but as soon as you decide that you can't become an astronaut, you'll, you'll go off the path. So just always be convinced that you can be one. Yeah, oblivious to the impossibility. And the other thing is you need to do something you have a passion for and enjoy and have fun. Because if you enjoy it, if you have a passion, if it's fun, you'll do better at it. And when you do better at it, that's the kind of things you need to be, uh, you know, to, to rise to the level of, you know, getting the opportunity to even interview or get selected. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to go after something you're interested in that may not seem to be a direct direct tie to space flight because um, it you'd be amazed at, at the variety. I mean, you're better off with a crew with a, a variety of backgrounds because then you have more different ways of, of solving problems on orbit. Wow, they're good answers. So there's a, um, how do astronauts know when it's safe to spacewalk? Well, that's, that's a very good question. So uh, interesting enough, uh, after I did my spacewalk, I got to work on the uh, uh, Geostationary Operation Environmental Satellites, GOES, R, and they have uh, instruments on them and they get the space weather. So there is a space daily space weather report that, um, as Mary mentioned, the solar max, the solar min, and um, it, you know, the daily weather uh, from the satellites we have going around the Earth and looking at the sun uh, will give us a prediction if, uh, uh, you know, it's safe that day uh, from the radiation standpoint to go out. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I, I really enjoyed hearing about the, you know, you could actually see the flashes in your eyes. It was pretty scary. Uh, but, um, uh, Corey, I just wanted to, to ask, I'm, I'm sure there are a couple more questions, but I realized we left one thing out and maybe we just had a chance to show it, which was um, that we're taking a helicopter to Mars and uh, called Ingenuity. So I didn't know if you had, had that. And, and Paul, did you want to talk to that? Oh, um, 
so yeah, helicopters, mechanisms, uh, you know, again, uh, some of the hardest things in space is things that move. You know, there's the electronics that make it move, but the motors, the gears, all this stuff, um, they're the things that usually fail. And so now you're trying to fly um, a helicopter and something that has different atmospheres. So you got different dynamics. And now you are actually flying like a, an aviator. And, uh, um, and so right. those mechanisms have to work in extreme conditions. And that's the challenge of, uh, you know, trying to design something. And Alvin, did you, you might have known a little more, more about this. I think you worked a little bit on it. Well, I'm just because I'm just in front of the fact is that, that the first thing we take off is, was a helicopter. Uh, and, yep. and, and that was, yep. Especially in something that's like a hundred times thinner atmosphere and, and, and helicopters have a hard enough time in the thick air of Earth. Mm. Yeah, and you know, Mars is farther away from the sun, so it's a lot colder. It's The average temperature is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So <laughs> you get, it's got to be able to work in really tough, conditions i know my iphone doesn't want it, its battery goes south pretty quickly in the cold <laughs> so looking forward to this because i think it will be the first time we've actually launched anything off of the planet mars we've landed lots of things there but nothing's ever taken back mm -hmm. off again I, I guess we should point out too that that uh while um perseverance uh uh will be collecting samples it's it's really for a yet defined or yet funded uh, mission to actually bring samples back for the first time uh, uh, from Mars, which is very exciting. Uh, as, um, I guess uh, there are all sorts of ideas in, in quarantine as well because we're looking for possible life. So very, ex very exciting. So I think we're going to ask our last yep. question now, and then I'm going to have uh, our survey link that we'd love to hear your input on. So I'm going to bring that up now. Would you go to Mars if you had the opportunity? No pun intended to the opportunity rover. <laughs> I, when I went to um, interview for my space shuttle job way back when, and they asked me what I wanted to do in space, I said I wanted to cross country ski on the Martian ice, ice cap. So I think so. I was That's ready. why you got the job. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I was a little ahead of my time. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, I would definitely go to Mars, but only if there was a round trip ticket. I do want that return trip uh, back to Earth. Yeah, uh, yeah. of and all the when, planets in the solar system, my favorite is Earth. <laughs> and when our this is uh, from my class, um, and we have uh, the Earth, Moon, and Mars uh, going going up here. So we thought we would be, you know, some of the ones maybe going to Mars. So it'll take a while. It's a group effort. So um, and uh, yep, I'd like the round trip too. <laughs> Yeah, I think it'd be tough to go to Mars and just say, okay, this is it. <laughs> be exciting, though. Yeah. yeah. So, Corey, was there any more, or are we about done? We're just about at time. We really appreciate our hearing from our guest astronauts today. It was so fantastic to have you. Thank you also to our chat scientists, to our partners for supporting this broadcast. And of course, thank you all for joining us. Um, before you go, we're going to reshare the link where you can watch the landing tomorrow. I hope you all tune in. Um, we're also going to be sharing a link to a survey because we'd love to hear what you thought about this program so we can improve our next one. And the first 30 people to respond are actually going to get a NASA logo sticker in the mail. So that's pretty cool. Um, so thank you again, everyone. And we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you.